Canyon are one of the biggest and arguably most disruptive brands on the bicycle market. We've come here to Koblenz to really delve deep into how a bike is designed, built and then sent out to the customer direct from their facilities here in the city. We're going to be speaking to the product managers, the engineers and those involved in the logistics to get a deeper insight into how this company works. Peter, you're a senior product manager on the road side of things at Canyon, is right. that right? Right, So, yeah. you've just launched the gravel bike and gravel bikes haven't been around for very long but the production and, and the ideas behind this bike must have been around for a few years now. How do you decide at such an early stage in a very immature market of gravel bikes to go ahead with doing it because it's quite a lot of resource. Is it a leap of faith, <laughs> for example? Yeah, that's a tricky part here. You have to um, kind of seven cents uh, mm -hmm. to feel what's going on and uh, and take the risk. What, what was it about gravel that made you think it's worth pursuing then? We know that it's a big thing in, in the US because there are not so many um, tarmac or asphalt roads uh, between east and west coast. There's the middle, middle west a lot of gravel roads. To have something which offers you the freedom of choice to go wherever you want and of course, it's the same or similar situation in Europe. A lot of forest roads and paths and yeah. uh, gravel roads as well. So the funny thing or the, the most sexy thing for a gravel bike is the freedom of choice. I think it will make the success of this segment and so we are confident it will have success. Product managers are present throughout the entire process of developing a new bike or product. With in-depth knowledge of the industry and market, technology and trends, they're some of the most important people within a bicycle brand. Daniel Oster heads up the more gravity oriented product management at Canyon. What is the sort of the general process then from the start to production? As I said, the main team is normally the, uh, the engineer, the designer and the product manager. Okay. And um, yeah, they first they discuss, okay, does it make sense to do such a product? How it should look like? What should it deliver, what travel, what geometry, how should the kinematic be, how the design should look like, mm -hmm. what special features. And then, yeah, and you try to find an agreement in the, mm -hmm. in the small group, for sure you also try to get then information from the outside. Okay. Uh, they said you talk to you talk to riders what they think, mm -hmm. and then you start normally with um, yeah with doing functional prototypes. With those functional prototypes, the engineers are working out. Um, you start first testings, and in the first testings, also the engineers, product managers, and pro riders are involved. We are working uh, really close together with uh, with the pro with our sponsoring uh, teams. Uh, we have our own factory teams where the relationship is even closer because the mechanics uh, belongs uh, to, to Kenyan. Yeah. The relation to, to these guys and to the test lab and to engineering, it's, it's really close. It's a really a small group of people giving feedback and uh, that works really perfect. And we have some uh, special tests, for example, uh, which is really coming out. So there's no standard, there's no ISO standard or, right. or anything else. It's really coming out of the experience from the teams. Uh, so we will have some special tests which we create out of the experience with our proteins. We have different uh, testing conditions, okay. different testing procedures for different categories of bikes. And if we find out there is a reason, we really update our testing conditions sure. if necessary. Okay. That, that happened not really frequently, but it, it, it happened yeah. from time to time, of course. When you're designing natural bike, what's the biggest challenge? How do you decide on the location of the pivots and the linkages and the, and the lengths and things? Is it quite computer-based? First, it's computer-based. Then you go into the uh, functional prototyping. Um, and as you can see here, you can uh, adjust the pivot points on this one. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have, for example, for the sender, we have different links for the leverage curve. We can model different kinematics and mm -hmm. different characteristics, which would work quite well. Mm -hmm. And then we go into testing to, to, to prove it or, right. or to see, okay, no, it's not working as we want it. And uh, yeah, then we have to do another loop. When it comes to the formulation of a new idea, so for example, the, the, the gravel bike, is that a decision that comes from someone else to you, or are you, are you responsible for the concept? No, and that's the idea, that's or? more that's more or less. It comes from product management because the product manager has to monitor the market 
to see what the demand of the market will be in three, four, five years or uh, even more. Of course, gravel, for instance, if you talk about uh, a gravel bike as an example, uh, was in the air since more or less five or six years. So the, okay. when the first gravel bikes came came up in, in the US and, mm -hmm. and then we um, define the, the first requirements. Should it have a mechanical suspension element okay. or should we go for a different solution? Bringing a new bike to market isn't as simple as designing a frame, sending the designs over to China to get the frame built. You've also got to assemble the bikes and Canyon do that in-house. And it's a massive logistical process that Canyon have to solve. When a new bike is being designed or is being created, do you work with the designers to ensure that what they are designing is something that can be effectively and efficiently built in the factory? Or, or do you take what they do and then work around that? How much go-between is there in the development of a new bike? Yeah, uh, for the development of a new bike is not a part we are uh, brought into the process. We just come here to the factory when, when the bike is built completely and the first assembling uh, part has to be built in, in the factory. And then we have to think about, okay, where should we have to store the material and what kind of material has to be assembled or mounted to the bicycle on what kind of station near during the assembly line. Because of this, we are working backwards. The finished products were assembled in the line and from the line, I have to take my strategy, where should I have the stock in a warehouse? Okay. Because for the optimization for logistic processes. So this all ties into the, the warehouses you have over there, yeah. where it's positioned, how high it is, where it's located in comparison to other areas, Perfect. just so that the, the machines can go and pick out the things optimally. Yeah. Okay, so in the storeroom where you have all the raw articles and all the raw goods, you have the pickers going up to what 12 meters high. Yeah. Uh, there's must be tens and hundreds of thousands of items in there, yeah. and they are each individually itemized. They're each individually marked. Because of the logistic system, uh, we we know exactly where each carton is on what kind of place in in the warehouse. We've got a completely chaotic logistic system. So, because of an of an code on the carton. We, we only save the, the carton to a concrete coordinate in the system and because of this redirection you know exactly where each material is in the warehouse and you don't have to search for anything. We, we take uh, pictures of, of each uh, fork uh, for example, so each, each fork and handlebar had a QR code inside yeah. here. So if you give me this QR code I can uh, take all the records out of the system, all the pictures uh, from this part the inspector, what, whatever. So if you give me your customer number or your bike number or your number of your handlebar or of your fork, yeah. then I give, give you all the records on the material traceability. It's totally given during the complete supply chain line. That seems to be a kind of a running theme through Canyon then because as a customer, I could go back and the RFID take, you know, all the tagging on yeah. there, you know, the, you can tell me how, what torque the bolt was done to. You yeah. can show me the picture from the CT scanner and you can track that back to exactly when it was delivered to the factory and through the whole process effectively. If you as customer have a problem with, with one part of the bicycle, we can redirect the whole process from the assembling backwards to the logistics and to say okay from this carton the, the part has been That's used for and you can get in contact with the OEM and say okay we've got a problem here with this carton maybe there is a charge of, of material you have to check twice uh, was it the only one was it unique or did you have gotten several problem and so this is unique I think in, in the bike industry that uh, that an, really a manufacturer can say the completely material way from, from the warehouse till the end of the product to yeah. the customer. While the product manager might have the biggest overall view of the market of trends and of technology that's coming in, engineers also have to be very aware of what the market wants from their bikes and what technologies and materials might arrive in the future so that they can fully plan for future bikes three or four years down the line. As an engineer, 
what is it that you're looking at when you sort of think about the next sort of five years? Are you looking at different materials, different ways of building frames? For example, industrial designers say, okay, we got, um, we need to have a certain look in five years. And you discuss about sketches and stuff like this, and really early you can already feedback to the designer, this should work. This mm -hmm. is maybe has something which we have to have to think about again. Um, maybe because we always need to um, hit certain weight targets, mm -hmm. stiffness targets, like these very hard facts, what at the end the magazines also can check on the test rig and stuff. So yeah. um, it's really important to consider these things um, really, really early in the process. But it's always a compromise between the demands of the um, product manager, the demand of the customer, also the demand of the designer. So. Mm -hmm. Product recalls cost companies millions of pounds, and so if you can reduce the chance that there's going to be a recall, you can save money well into the future. Canyon's in-house CT scanning is another layer to their in-house quality control process. Okay, so finally that's our uh, CT uh, scanner here. Okay. Uh, so we have one machine here and uh, we have another one, two, three, four, five machines in, in Asia. Okay. Um, this machine in Asia uh, belongs to our production partners, so that, that's of our own belonging. So it's a really expensive machine. We speak about roughly half a million euro. Half a million so that, that, okay. that's, a, that's a huge invest. The carbon fiber process is more or less a handmade process. Mm -hmm. If you speak about a handmade process, you have a, a bigger range of quality. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's somehow normal. If there something happen, then somebody get hurt, and that, that should not be. That's the reason why we still proceed with a 100% inspection for carbon fiber forks, handlebars, and cockpits. Everything that's carbon fiber at the front of the bike goes through one of these? Yes. On every production bike that you do? Every part, yes. It takes some time, so it takes some minutes uh, per part, and okay. at the end it takes money. Yeah. yeah. But on the other side, um, safety first. I mean, if you can prevent a recall or that somebody get hurt, what is money in comparison to that? We've seen a number of women-specific bike launches from Canyon over the past year or so. It's something that Canyon take very seriously. It's a growing market with its own needs and requirements. I'm Catherine and I'm working as a product manager for okay. Canyon. I started four, almost yeah, four years ago now and that was the inception mm -hmm. of, of the women's category. Okay. So when you've built, say, the Spectral Women's, for example, you haven't just taken the unisex spectral or the men's spectral, whatever you want to call it, and you've not done a shrink and pink. You have designed it from the ground up, yeah. but drawing influences from, is there, is there a lot of parts taken from the general overall design of the Spectral or is it completely ground up? It was completely ground up, but we have one um, Canyon design language mm -hmm. and it's fitting into that language. Okay. So we have that across the whole mountain bike and also across the whole road range. Mm -hmm. We didn't reinvent the bike completely, so yeah. we had a few things where we knew that that works pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, but we tested a lot of different geometries, mm -hmm. also different kinematics. and. That was the starting point, and then where's the different focus? And okay. it was one point, for example, the standover height. With the current or with the spectral design, mm -hmm. we couldn't reach a really low standover height. Right. And um, yeah, we wanted to have a different design, but still fitting into the Canyon design language. Okay. Um, and with the design, we also could lower the standover height by almost two centimeters. Mm -hmm. So in, in general then, what is, what is the basic differences then, say between the spectral and the spectral women's? So yeah, we have a slightly different geometry. It's slacker head angle, about half a degree. Okay. And yeah, the main feature is the different kinematic. It's not just a different suspension tune, mm -hmm. but uh, we worked on a different leverage curve to get it even more sensible that it fits better to lighter riders. Okay. We did it before with different saddle, more narrow handlebars, mm -hmm. 780 is pretty wide for yeah. a female rider. Mm -hmm. and we also have different gearing, so okay. we ha women do have less power, okay. and I always had the impression that the smallest gear could never be small enough. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, that's why uh, I focused also on that. So you're running like a, a smaller chainring, for yeah. example. Yeah. So if you if you look at the industry, sort of three or four years ago, there was a, a big rise in women specific bikes. You know, the lots of specialized live, Trek. You know, and they were bringing out women specific designs with their own geometries and this sort of thing. Canyon have sort of come to this now at a time when arguably a number of companies are going back to having just one size fits all frames. You know, how do you respond to the industry going back to the original status quo? 
we use our data and um, we believe in our data mm -hmm. and um, we test it with a lot of female riders, also with men and um, that is what, what the result shows, showed us, um, yeah. that we can make a bike better for those different uh, genders. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and for the average rider of this gender. It's therefore worth having that extra cost, because yeah. undoubtedly it is an extra cost to have that. It is. Most components fitted to Canyon bikes come from OEM suppliers. So at what point are those components thought about in the design process of a bike? When you are developing the frame, uh, you already have to see, okay, what parts should okay. fit on. Uh, for example, should the bike be designed for an air shock, for a coil shock? Mm -hmm. What brakes, what forks, what cranks should fit on? So this on. is a consideration from the start of the process? Uh, yeah, more or less. Okay. Yeah. With the number of changing standards that seems to be happening a lot with mountain biking, that's obviously something that tends to be bought in by the component manufacturers, whether it's Boost, or, or you know the 12 speed on the back or whatever it is how much of a pain in the ass is that for you as a frame builder and designer and then going into the bikes sometimes it's definitely a nightmare especially for the for the engineers if you are now working with metric shocks and then the frames you already have in your lineup mm -hmm. They don't work with the newest shock generations and mm -hmm. then the, also for the customer it's difficult because then the customer has to buy a bike with a yeah, somehow old shock. Standards are always changing in the bike industry and loads of different players are creating these changes. So how do they know what they're going to fit to a bike when it's released? Sometimes it's difficult to work with them, but we try to be involved as early as possible in development phases. Uh, our input is well received. So because they respect what we do, and so we have a certain influence. My name is Daniel. Um, I'm a product engineer at Canyon since uh, three years. Okay. So, and my main role here as a product engineer is for sure to work on special projects like we have it behind us, uh, the new gravel bike. What do you think in five years time we're going to be seeing? Maybe it's like integration, further integration. Maybe it's connectivity. Maybe it's like um, giving uh, the customer just more options. So it's, it's all about the customer for us. So we are customer centric uh, a company and we always should think about what the customer will need. Mm -hmm. It's tough to get behind the mind of the customer, yeah. but I think we are in a good way with that. We try to push innovation for sure. So sometimes a true innovation needs a revolution. That's what we say. Yeah. But we always try to give the customer as many opportunities you can imagine. So this handlebar for sure comes with a Garmin mount. Uh, we are offering like different options. You can perfectly fit, like there are like multiple options around for, for lights you can actually mount on this handlebar. So it's rather pushing other third party companies to actually think about what they did in the past, mm -hmm. other than saying, okay, we just adapt what they have, so we are limited. So they also should think about if is a round shape still a good shape or should we adapt other shapes. There are so many different shapes around the whole bicycle that, and I think some of the light suppliers, they introduced those silicon straps and they're working perfectly with like any shape you can imagine. We're not the first ones who thought like round shapes are not good anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just that we, I think we are pushing the boundaries a little and they will follow because they have to because everyone will as well. If you wanted to be the trendsetter, how do you decide maybe what the market doesn't have but what it does need? We are riders by ourselves, um, we have a lot of pro riders and we are looking at the market, we are talking a lot uh, with you guys mm -hmm. uh, and you're thinking about where the market is going and based on this trying to find the new things to yeah. develop. The new things to develop, yeah. We take the risk to come with something new as well. Okay. So it's for, for us, it's, it's more to be a trendsetter mm -hmm. and to be innovative than to be a kind of fast follower and to copy someone. It's been really interesting getting this access to Canyon's facilities and we hope it's given you greater insight into how major bicycle companies operate. Let us know if you'd like to see more content like this in the future and don't forget to like or subscribe.